Welcome back to The Knowledge, the series here on Racing TV that looks ahead to our major flat festivals. In this show, we'll be focusing on the brilliant Kipco British Champions Day, a six-race bonanza that marks the end of the main turf flat season, also crowns our champion jockeys. Five of its races are pattern events, four of those are Group 1, and we end, of course, with the typically competitive Ascot Straight Mile Handicap. In this edition of The Knowledge, we're also going to take the unusual step of looking back at the top two-year-old performances from last week, the Dubai Future Champions Festival that we focused on in the last edition of The Knowledge. We're going to find out how the handicapper reacted. In this show, we're also going to be joined by Chris Dixon and Sam Turner. They'll be joining me shortly to guide you through Saturday's card. But first, let's get to know Ascot that bit better. So it's ostensibly two courses, the straight and the round, but a special Champions Day arrangements means that the inner round course can be used if heavy appears in the going description. It's looking unlikely at this stage. Uh, the straight track is much quicker to drain than the round. All races up to seven are on the straight mile, as are both miles races on Champions Day. The round course is a bit of a misnomer. It's actually more triangular. It's a right-handed track uh, covering just over one mile six. It's galloping and quite stiff in nature. Tactics wise, this is how races tend to develop. The straight track often rewards patient tactics in races, particularly staged over seven furlongs and a mile. The opposite applies on the round course. That's due to the relatively short two and a half furlong run in. The draw is important on both tracks, but in different ways. High draws favoured on the round, which is perhaps counterintuitive. Fields can split into two or more groups on the straight track. A favourable draw usually depends on being drawn near lasting pace. Either rail can be favoured if a track bias emerges or people think there is a track bias. And racing on the wing of the field or a group is often a disadvantage. So joining me first on this show, looking ahead to Kipco British Champions Day, is Chris Dixon. Chris, welcome. What will you be basing ground-wise all of your calculations on in this show? I think good to soft, Lydia. Um, I think looking at the going stick reading as it stands at, at the time of recording this programme, it's, it's what I think, 7.4 on the straight course, 6.4 on the round course. That's much better than it was, say, last year. For Champions Day, which was obviously running in very deep conflict, it was much, much better. So we're at a time of year where the ground can't we? Is in there, we'll stay locked in extent, but I think the good we can I'll be basing it on. Okay, so it's time to get on with things, and we're going to start first of all here on the knowledge by looking ahead to the QE2, the Milers. The two most significant races on Kipco British Champions Day occupy the final two of the final three slots on the card. The first of them is the QE2 sponsored by Kipco. It's a group one over a mile. It was established in 1955, originally as a group two, upgraded to this level in 1987. Used to be run in Newmarket in September. It was transferred to Ascot in October, not uncontroversially when Kipco British Champions Day was created. Where do horses that run here go next? Well, the Breeders' Cup mile and the Hong Kong mile are potential targets. These are the people who've done best in the QE2. Godolphin and Sire Bin Saror teamed up very successfully. Willie Carson, though, registered eight wins himself. Um, the most successful horses have registered two wins, notably Brigadeau Gerard in 1971-72. to 72. And since this race was run at Ascot, Minding has got from start to finish quickest. Now, here are the mile standings. Palace Pier is currently the world's top rated miler on 125. Lord North retains a BHA rating of 123, but earned that for 10 furlong performances last season. He's got a performance figure of 120 for his Dubai Turf success over nine furlongs in March. That's why he appears in this list. Ben Battle, by the way, is yet to run to 117 this season. He holds performance figures of 115 so far for his two efforts. Lucky Vega has a BHA performance figure of 117 for his sorry 116 for his Guinness third, whereas he is 117 with his domestic handicapper. And the Revenant is rated two pounds lower by the French handicapper than by the BHA. You have him on 117 here, than by the official rating that he goes into this. The horses with the asterisk next to their name, well, they're running in the QE2. 
And here are the declarations for this really exciting event. Ten runners, fantastic to see Palace Pier versus Baid with the likes of Alcohol Free, Lady Bothorpe, Master of the Seas and Ben Battle thrown in for good measure. Now you've heard that uh, dodgy signal we had from Chris earlier. Hence, he's relocated before we start getting into the nitty gritty of form. Chris, let's start by talking about the lock-in stakes, shall we, in which Palace Pier was so magnificent. Lady Bothorpe ran really well in second. Lord Glitters also an admirable fourth. Yeah, this was this was a tremendous display, really, from Palace Pier. He obviously had a, a run behind him going into this, so he was ready, but then so was Lady Bothorpe. And Lady Bothorpe has gone on and, and franked this form since. But just look at the way with which the ease with which he's going you can see the frankie's looking all around looking for the dangers they're non-existent he pushes the button over two furlongs out and very quickly clears away from his field and this was a very very impressive display now um the, the form isn't outstanding but as i said there's a future group one winner in second spot top rank under these kind of conditions is a useful enough horse and look at the distance that the front two have put between themselves and the rest and how easy it was for palace pier so that's a, a real classy performance from him very much so let's have a look at the time he was beaten shall we in this race last year the revenant managed to win the qe2 in 2020 palace pier things went wrong for him he still finished third lord glitters in sixth yeah, and things didn't go right for Palace Pier. I think the run of the race was was key last year, wasn't it? And I think that it's potentially going to be a similar scenario this year because as you go down this 10-strong ten, ten field for the QE2, there is a, a, a clear lack of regular front-running horses in the field. Last year, Roseman, you can see in the yellow colours, took them along and ends up finishing in second spot, only worn down by the Revenant by a very narrow margin. And this was a massive career best from Roseman so that showed the extent to which tactics played their part last year and they may do so again on this uh, uh, this time around and it didn't suit Palace Pier now I do wonder if they might sit him a little bit handier they did do at Sandown they did do early on in his career and with last year's defeat in mind will they decide to sit him a little bit close to the pace I think they might do but the the two probably lesser performances of Palace Pier's career to date have been on the straight track. He won on the round course at uh, Royal Ascot in a St. James's Palace very impressively a couple of years back. But this year's win in the Queen Anne wasn't widely impressive. It was more workmanlike. And that defeat last year is two runs on the straight track. So that's just a nagging doubt if you're wanting to pick holes in him at the top of the market. Interesting point. Um, he, of course, has also won the Jacques Lemarois, winning the Moulin Group 1 and stepping up from Group 3 to Group 1 company over in France was Baid. We can take a look at his Group 3 success. That was in the Thoroughbred Stakes, Chris, at the Goodwood Festival. Yeah, and if you're talking about the, the level of horses that he's beating, well, he can't hold a match to one, a few, one or two of these, can he? Most notably, Palace Pier. Um, he beats horses El Drama in second gear um, and other horses that don't have group class winning form. They're just not group winning horses. So you would kind of want him to go and beat them easy if he's going to make his mark at group one level. And he does. And then on the back of this, obviously, in France, he goes on and wins his group one at the first attempt uh, trying top level competition. So he was not impressive on the clock this day. The overall time wasn't great, but in being able to put the amount of distance between himself and the rest mm. in a race that wasn't run to suit in a sense to, to be won by a wide margin you had to be impressed and then he's gone and won a group one he had to make harder work of it in France but I still don't feel we got to the f fully to the bottom of what we uh, of where Baid is I don't think we yet know how good he is and I think he's getting better Yep, I agree with that. And William Haggis, interestingly, said going towards the Mulan that they didn't have the most straightforward preparation either. And it, things have been more straightforward heading to Ascot. Let's have a look at Alcohol Free, a brilliant Group 1 winner as a two-year-old. She then went to the Sussex Stakes um, after defeats in the Guineas, but a success at Royal Ascot. And here she took the scalp of Poetic Flair. Yeah, the same horse that Palace Pier beat for his most recent Group 1. And beating in tidier fashion. I don't think Critic Flair ran as well here as he did in France when Palace Pier beat him. Um, but you can't really knock alcohol free on this occasion. She's a, a filly that has surprised me through the course of this season. I didn't think she was going to develop into a miler and stay well enough 
not only does she set, stay a mile, she stays it well, and they've subsequently given her a, a, a try over 10 furlongs, which, you know, perhaps um, wasn't suitable, but it was great that they tried it. She's back down to a mile. The ground conditions will suit her, and I suspect that the track will suit her pretty well. Yeah, um, defeated last time out when stepped over 10 furlongs in the international. Let's stick with the Phillies and have a look at the 1,000 guineas, shall we? That was won by Mother or Earth, who has been a doubting, consistent performer at the highest level this season. Alcohol-free, only fifth on this occasion. Yeah, um, and I, I suppose at this point I was thinking, well, alcohol-free um, isn't going to be as good as she looked last year and, and she might be better off back uh, back down over shorter distances but she's um, no match for Mother Earth on this occasion. Mother Earth hasn't quite managed to um, go on and, and build as much on this as I thought she might do but having said that she has gone on to further group one success so you can't really knock her and I think what she might have is a tactical advantage in this race because she did race fairly close up in the Falmouth didn't she mm. um, Mother Earth and I wonder whether taking a look at the lack of pace in the race whether they may feel that there is a, a tactical advantage to be had and they may well ride her a little bit closer up again she has been very very consistent she hasn't consistently wowed me but you know she is very very solid I suspect there'll be something better there but I think she will run well an intriguing form line is the Joel Stakes where Ben Battle had Master of the Seas returning from a long break back in third what did you make of this Chris? Uh, I think it's a piece of form that he's going to need to be improved upon. Um, Pogo finishes in second spot, and we know enough about him to think that he he wouldn't be a, um, a a strong enough contender to mark down as a real solid Group 1 form line coming in. So, Group 2 company here, and I think Ben Battle, who bombed out in this race a couple of years back, has at least got a couple of runs behind him this time around. I think he went, when he disappointed in this in the past, on the back of one run in this race. Um, you, you've got to like the way that he knuckles down and wins the race, but I suspect that he'll need to improve quite a lot on this, even just to uphold the form with Master of the Seas, who I think it was quite apparent beforehand that and, and openly uh, talked about that this horse might have needed the run in the Joel Stakes. He's ridden like he was looked after late on, nursed through the final part of the race, and I think he will be a much straighter horse, and I actually feel that um, that piece of form for, for Ben Battle is going to need to be improved upon quite a bit. Yes, and Master of the Seas, of course, early in the season for the 2000 guineas, with some excuses, quite closely matched with Poetic Flair. Very briefly yeah. to, to round up, Chris, if you can be brief with this and also mention Lady Bothorpe while you're doing so. Uh, Lady Bothorpe, another one that is a, a tremendous mare and, and she's had a cracking season, proven Group 1 performer. I'd hope that she'd run well. It boils down to, I think, Palace Pier and Baid, they are the key contenders. They could be inconvenienced by a messy race, hopefully not. But I think Baid has loads of tactical speed. I think this track will suit him very well, and he's the bigger price of the two. He doesn't have the substance to his form at this stage, Lydia. I don't think anyone could argue that being the case, but it's one of those. It's style over substance, and on this occasion, I'm going with the style. I'm going with Baid. Okay. Chris, thank you. We'll hear more from Chris Dixon later in the show. Now we need to go to another Chris. Chris Stickles, the clerk of the course at Ascot. He has a ground update for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we, we do generally save ground for this meeting. And we, when we go to, we go to quite, you know, quite some lengths, really, to try and make sure we've got decent ground for this meeting. We, for, so for the first October meeting, we put the stools on the stand side and we rail off the far side of the track. And so we encourage the runners to use this stands rail. And on the round course, we rail out quite, um, quite wide. So we've got four, four metres increasing to 14 as you turn into the straight of, of, of saved ground on the inside on the round course. So, you know, we have and, and we've opened that up and we've now got, you know, obviously really nice ground on the inside of the, uh, of the round course and saved ground on the far side of the straight. So there's decent ground. I mean, at the moment, we're, we're good to soft on the straight and um, soft, good to soft in places on the round course. And we do, of course, have that option of using the inner course if heavy, uh, if we find heavy ground appearing on, on, on the round course here. But I, it, it looks really unlikely. That I, I think if the ground, if, you know, if, if the forecast is correct and the ground stays pretty reasonable, you know, we, we will have a stellar lineup. You, you know, and I, I think that, you know, actually each year, you, you know, the, the, the runners do, you know, we do get good quality each year, but this year does look like it could be exceptional. You know, Ade are still in the, the champion stakes at this stage. You know, I know Ade would probably like it softer, but, you know, that won, it, that won the champion stakes last year. We've got Revenant, who probably also wants it softer in the, in the QE2. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, great lineup at the moment and something really to look forward to.
So we've had two Chris's. Time for a Sam. Sam Turner joins me now as the second pundit to look ahead to Kipco British Champions Day. Sam, welcome to the show. How are you? Are you looking forward to Saturday? I am, Lydia. I think I think Saturday's meeting could be some of the best racing that we've um, we've seen all season. To be honest, there look some fascinating matchups through the card, some brilliant head to heads, and uh, none more so in the opening race as well, the stairs race, which looks a, a fantastic renewal. I've asked Chris already, but what are you basing your judgments on ground-wise? OK, well, I see. Well, it's it, it's dried out a little bit more. Um, obviously, down in Swindley Bottom, it's still soft, but other parts of the track on the round course, good to soft and, and good to soft in the straight. We're supposed to have a couple of drying days other than the shower. Um, so I think it will be probably good to soft on the round course, plenty of juice, just enough to keep True Sham fans excited and motivated. And I think the, the straight track might dry out a little bit and just be dead ground because we're getting these heavy dews and um, obviously early nights now, unfortunately. So that's that's ensuring that the moisture retains in the ground. So I think it'll be a really nice racing surface, hopefully. OK, there's a Sam thought. Let's get on with the show and have a look at the Kipco Champions Long Distance Cup. So here's a brief history of the Long Distance Cup, which is essentially a two-mile race, Group 2, originally the Jockey Club Cup, and it's gone up through the rankings from Group 3 status when the pattern was originally established. It also has been two-mile two and 12 furlongs in its time. And where do horses that run in this race go next? Well, really, we're pivoting towards next year with the long distance, the marathon distance stayers. We're thinking about the Dubai Gold Cup, the Cigaro Stakes back at Ascot over the course and distance, and the Yorkshire Cup at York's Dante meeting in May. These are the people who have dominated this race, notably Barry Hills and Sir Gordon Richards. Barry Hills, of course, the trainer of Further Flight, who won the Jockey Club Cup five times. We've taken the fastest winner since the race was staged at Ascot, that was Fame and Glory, in 2011. And the disparity between his time and the track record held by Mizzou obviously compares with two mile races that are held at Ascot earlier in the season on better ground. So this is how we stand in terms of the top European stayers. And when we say European stayers in this extreme marathon category, we basically mean the best marathon stayers in the world. And that is subjectivist on 122 for his Ascot Gold Cup success or plain Gold Cup success. The three-year-old Hurricane Lane has done excellently, posting 121 in the St. Ledger. He's also maintained that rating over shorter distances. True Shans there, the winner of this race last year and last time out in the Cadran. Stradivarius is interesting. Now on 119, of course, he was 125 after his 2020 Gold Cup success. His mark was revised to 121 following just before his Yorkshire Cup success and he's been dropped £2 to his current mark following his Cadran defeat by Trishan last time out. So Ron Priestley has a couple of asterisks because he's actually rated 118 but that rating achieved over a mile and a half whereas his best ranking over a mile and six and further is 116. And I should also mention the Mayor Princess Zoe who like Trishan and Stradivarius runs in the Long Distance Cup. She is currently rated 114. Let's start going through this form then with Sam and we'll start with last year's renewal and that was won by Trishan as I mentioned with Mirando back in fourth and Stradivarius disappointing on this occasion finishing 12th and eased. Yeah some proper soft ground here as well Lydia and an exhilarating performance really from Trishan who really announced himself on the on the world stage really for stayers um, just the way in which he lengthened off this home turn, really. I'm not saying he didn't look as though he was going anywhere. He was still travelling particularly well, but just the distance that he put between himself and Search for a Song, you know, top-class mare in her own right over these sort of distances, um, just operating on the ground better than anything in this race. And, you know, it could be a case of the same again on Saturday. Whether the ground will be quite as bad as this, I don't know. Um, but he has proved that as long as there's just some juice in the ground, then that gives him the opportunity to operate in this manner. We've seen he's fully effective at Ascot, he's fully effective at the tail end of the year, albeit a long year, where he's had a couple of absentees because of the ground. Races such as the Doncaster Cup and obviously the Gold Cup in June at the Royal Meeting, he wasn't enabled to, to tackle those races because the ground dried out or the rains didn't come as he would have expected. Um, but he looks like you know, a world-class performer. We saw that in the CAD run as well. There was one or two misgivings and, and worries that he wouldn't see out that extended trip on the bottomless ground at Longchamp, but he did in spades and um, he's just a tremendous performer. Only been beaten once with Holly Doyle on in about five starts as well. Uh, that came at the hands of Japan, obviously at Chester in May, but 
other than that, an unblemished record and a rock solid market leader. Yes, he is a Group 1 stayer and of course he announced that in the Goodwood Cup. That was going to be the clash between him and Stradivarius. In the end we had to wait for the cadron for it because Stradivarius was withdrawn from the Goodwood Cup but Trushan was magnificent. He was and you know this was his, his I wouldn't say his day in the sun because he'd already announced himself as, as I say as a, as a world class stayer at this meeting 12 months ago but this was sort of his um, I don't know, it's, it's recognition really at Group 1 level. Yes, it was um, a weaker race than it could have been, obviously with Stradivarius' uh, late absenteeism. But, you know, these races have still got to be won. And although people will point to the form and say, well, the way he goes was in second, and look at his head carriage and the way that he races and the fact that he's been beaten in a handicap by the Ebor. But Truchance just strode away from them majestically as he tends to do uh, when the going gets tough. And he just operates so well in that ground. He seems to have a different cruising speed and a different level of acceleration to many other horses at that ground. So, um, providing this long season doesn't catch up with him, and there's a chance that he has been kept on the ball for quite a long time. As I say, he had those those dates pencilled in at, at Doncaster and also at uh, the Royal Meeting as well and went elsewhere and was just kept ticking over by Alan King, who's done an admirable job with him this year. You know, providing this race doesn't come at the end of a long season, then it's difficult to see him not being involved again. Let's talk Stradivarius then, who uh, tried the arc at the back end of last season, was disappointing in the long distance cup, but come back in the Cigaro, then got beaten in the Gold Cup, didn't go to Goodwood. Then we saw this pulsating battle in the Lonsdale with Spanish Mission. Yeah, this was a wonderful race. <laughs> One of the races of the season, really. Um, it was a two runner race in, in all but name, albeit it was a, they went a good clip thanks to the front runner. Um, and they just had a fantastic duel all the way down the nave mine, didn't they, these two? And Stradivarius, doing as Stradivarius does, so stuck his tongue out to his rival and uh, just bobbed him on the line. But I think the assessor and the handicapper views a lot of his performances as, as very much much of a muchness of a, of a one consistent level this year. Um, if you look at various sort of form students, they will all sort of assess that, you know, the run at Ascot behind Subjectivist, the run here in, in the Lonsdale Cup, the run at Doncaster and, and even at Longchamp last time were all of a very similar quality. And, you know, he has to, you have to say at the age of seven, really, is he going to be open to any more improvement? No. Is this race going to see him to the best of his ability on, on dead ground in the autumn? Probably not. And, you know, he's already got it to do to, to mix it with one or two of these horses that are up and coming and, and thrusting upwards on their curve of improvement. So, um, it's a stiff task for him, but great to see him sportingly campaigned and, uh, you know, fingers crossed he, he, he goes well and, and gives the race a little bit more luster and, and glamour. OK, let's move to a relatively unknown quantity, at least over this trip, and that's Hamish. He's only had the one run this season. That was this success in the Group 3 September stakes. Yeah, this was a tremendous piece of training. Obviously, he'd been off for such a long time. I think since finishing fourth in the Hardwick behind Fanny Logan, so we haven't seen him for a long time. Um, a bit like us in lockdown, this was Hamish. But, you know, he produced a really good performance here to be Hookham. Um, Hookham admittedly has got one or two breathing frailties, but uh, he didn't show any of those next time out because he won by six lengths and absolutely bolting up in a Group 3 at Ascot. So the form's already had a, a ring of endorsement to it. And Hamish quickened really well here on the inside to win quite comfortably. He operates well on soft ground. As we know, he goes well round Ascot. He ran really well say in the Hardwick went fourth to Fanny Logan that was a fair performance um, he's got form closely tied with Trushan from their newbie run in the um, in the autumn of 2019 so he's a horse very interesting he's drawn one here which which might not make life easy for him going into that first bend quite quickly um, and he's also got the bounce factor to sort of overcome as well the fact that he's returned to the track within six weeks I'm sure he's been expertly trained by his handler it looks to have a strong hand all throughout the card, but there's others that appeal to me more, I must admit, on Saturday. OK, so that is Hamish representing William Haggis. Let's move now on to the Mediterranean, who is potentially, Sam, the only pace angle in the race. Yeah, we've obviously got a couple of uh, absentees that would like to, to, to sail along in front, and they both miss. So we're, we're left with the Mediterranean as the, the likely pace angle. Um, obviously, he's run really creditably on a number of occasions this year, over a raft of differences, second in a Volsiger, third in a Ledger, and second at the Curry in a Group 3 here behind Search for a Song. So, you know, very, very solid, dependable, um, 
versatile animal from a raft of you know 12 furlongs to two miles kept at it here i just i can't help feel that there's going to be one or two with a little bit more thrust over the the final stage of this two mile than, Medi than the mediterranean but if he's allowed to dominate and dictate his own pace then he could be uh, an interesting horse would possibly reach the frame at a price but he's really going to need to get a fine tactical ride i think to to withstand the likes of Trushan, at Baron Samadhi, Hamish, etc. Okay, let's have a look at Princess Zoe next, shall we? She was magnificent when winning the Group 1 Cadran last season. This season, she's finished fifth in that and second in a Gold Cup. What about conditions for her here, Sam? Yeah, I, I would think they're fine. Um, I was a little bit disappointed with her in the Cadran. I thought she travelled so well that she was really going to take herself into the race and, and launch a bit of a challenge, but she... She just couldn't cope with the power and the stability of Trushan in the closing stages. And, and to be fair, not, not many could. I mean, she hasn't quite lived up to the heights of, of last year, um, but this was another fair performance. You know, really good effort, um, travelled quite well over a trip that probably wasn't quite her best. I think she's better over the extended two miles and, and beyond. And this was a fine effort behind a horse that's difficult to pass when in the mood. And we saw that again uh, with, with Twilight Payment, who's, you know, is pretty gutsy individual, but she's a she's a fine mare. She's carried on the traditions of last year, and everybody felt that you know last year perhaps you know it was a little bit of a I wouldn't say it's a fluke because she progressed admirably all throughout the campaign. But you know you just wondered whether she was ever going to reach those heights again. But she has run credibly all season. Conditions would be absolutely fine for her. As I say, she travelled into that long shot race like the wrath of God. So you know she still remains in very good heart. I think. Okay. The final bit of evidence we've got is the Irish St. Ledger, and that was won by Sonny Boy Liston, who previously had won the Ebor, of course. He doesn't go in the Long Distance Cup, but Baron Samadhi does. He finished third, and matter of reality, also in the race, he was further behind. Yeah, I thought this was a really good effort, to be honest. I think, you know, the plus points of Baron Samadhi is that he's been quite light, lightly campaigned this year. He started off at Navin in a Group 3, progressed uh, and one out in America, um, then then obviously went to uh, Saint Cloud for the Grand Prix de Saint Cloud, and then came to the Curragh for the Irish Ledger. I thought this was a really good performance. You know, he's entitled to be a little bit ring rusty. He'd been off since the fourth of July. He got left behind a little bit when the pace quickened, and Sonny Boy Liston, who travelled supremely well throughout, and put the race to bed with a, with a decent turn of foot. But Baron Samuel, you can see, just grinding away all the way down the outside, closing on the main protagonist. I thought this was a really, really sound run. I think probably a career best. Interesting that uh, Joseph O'Brien reaches for the cheek pieces as well on Saturday. That could extricate a little bit more form from him. And um, as I say, he's, he's lightly raced. Only had three or four starts. The two miles should suit him ideally. Goes with some cuts in the ground. He should be there and thereabouts if he handles Asker. So your final thoughts then as we look at the 12 declared runners? I think if there's enough juice in the ground, I think Trushan is, is a worthy favourite. And I, I know there was a fair bit of money for him overnight. Um, I think Baron Samadhi is definitely a player. And um, I wouldn't write out Bark Scirocco, second in the St. Ledger last year, operates well around Ascot. And uh, interesting for me that uh, Andrew Balding brings him here on the back of just two runs and, and pitches him in at this level. So I think he might reward those who, who like a, a play at a bigger price. I agree, Sam. He's a lively one, I reckon. Thank you very much for your thoughts on the Long Distance Cup. We'll hear more from Sam in a few moments' time. Next, we're going to hear from Chris Dixon about the sprint. The first Group 1 on British Champions Day is the British Champions Sprint. It's over six furlongs, originally established as the Diadem in 1946 renamed and reverted to October from a September date in 2011 and has climbed its way upwards through the ranks to Group 1 in 2015. These are the people who've done best in this event. The fastest winner since the race was staged at Ascot as the Tin Man in 2016. Now, ratings, as I mentioned before, when I talked about the uh, top rated European sprinters, there's a difference of opinion, Geoffrey, between um, the French handicapper who has Sueza on 1 2 1 still for her win at Goodwood and the performance figure in Britain, which is 1 1 9 there. They're also in France more favourable about Mariana Foot at 1 1 7 for his Maurice de Guise win than the BHA performance figure of 1 1 6. Dream of Dreams retains an official rating of 120, um, but has only run to 1 1 8 in his two starts this season, and we're not going to be seeing 
thing again this year. The Jai Cup has been revised downwards by a pound, hence Starman and Dragon Symbols' new ratings. Gustavus Weston, who runs at Ascot, achieved his rating by winning the Group 3 Phoenix Sprint. And you should know that the Abbey winner, A Case of You, is on 113. Here are the declarations for this Group 1. A big field, 20 runners. Notably there, Art Power, Gustavus Weston, as I mentioned, Happy Power, also interesting. Kin Ross for Frankie Dottori. Dragon Symbol will be wanting to get his head in front after being disqualified in the Commonwealth Cup over the course and distance, or demoted rather. Minzal's back. Rohan, of course, won over the course and distance in the Wokingham. Happy Romance, another interesting runner along with the Dream. Right, Chris, the first horse that we're going to look at is Art Power, and this is a really impressive five length success at Group 3 level at the Curra. Massively impressive performance, this. He gets the better of the um, improving Twilight Spinner. We don't yet know her level. She's unexposed. This is her start point for the Joseph O'Brien team, and she previously won well for David O'Mara um, in listed company at Haydock. But he absolutely blows this field apart, Art Power, this day, and, and he's very, very impressive in doing so. It's all so easy for him, and it's just a, a performance full of class. And it was the performance of a horse that has been running very, very well in Group 1 company and not quite proving up to that level, taking on some slightly lesser horses and proving absolutely dominant on the day. If he turns up in this sort of form, then he's going to have a fair enough chance because this isn't quite as deep a group one as some of those that he has been in this year. A lot of the um, sprinters that you put up on that graphic there, the leading sprints on ratings this, this time around, aren't in this field, nor indeed are the winners of the, the premier six furlong group one races in Britain, the likes of Starman, the July Cup winner, the Haydock Sprint Cup winner, uh, Amaratiana, and Dream of Dreams, the Diamond Jubilee winner, all absent from this race. He's got form in and around them and he's drawing stall 20. You mentioned at the uh, start of the programme with the track facts, the, the draw can favour one way or the other. Well, if it ends up favouring high numbers, which it could, then it would bring him into the mix even more. OK, interesting stuff. Let's move to some Group 1 evidence, Chris, and go to the Flying Five at the Curra in mid-September. This was won by a romantic proposal. But back in fourth was Dragon Symbol, Rohan was fifth, Gustavus Weston sixth. Yeah, it could be um, a key form line, this, couldn't it? And uh, the runner-up in this race, A Case of You, has gone on to win the Abbey, so it has had a, a top-level form frank since then. Um, Rohan picked him up, finishing off well. He needs to break better, doesn't he? Ascot as a track, we saw him in the work and very impressive. Um, it is one that, that should suit him, has suited him in the past, and if there is a pace collapse, it would help him. But he could do with being... Um, better in the early part of the race really and not giving himself that struggle i think dragon symbol is the one that you take from this race i think he makes a move that looks like he's going to go and and win the contest and again talking about those top level group one races he's been in the mix second in a few of them and with those big guns out of the way i think he's the one to beat my one little niggle lydia is that he looked like he was going to win that race and he just dropped away late on he's had a long hard season can they get him to the well once more and, pro and, and show his very best form. I do think that six furlongs suits him better than five. Yep. And I think Ascot is a track that suits him very well. So I'm hoping that he can get back to that earlier season form. But that would be my one doubt that at the back of a, uh, a long campaign, he just dropped away a little bit more tamely than I would have liked last time. I take that point and he can hang under pressure as well, albeit he ran a bit straighter there. Right, let's have a look at some seven furlong form next, shall we? We're going to the Qatar Festival at Goodwood. We're going to look at the Lennox Group 2. Happy Power is third, Creative Force is second and the winner is Kin Ross. And Kin Ross picks up impressively, doesn't he? From the back of the field, he buries a passage through and I really like the way that he quickens up. Now, he's got to prove himself as a six furlong horse and the different tempo of race, I suppose, you run harder for longer over six and maybe don't rely quite so much on that ability to quicken very sharply, which Kinross on these kind of conditions seems to have. And you see it here. Look at him in comparison to creative force on the outside of him and how much more um, sharply he manages to, to pick up, I suppose. But um, still, I think creative force runs very well. And I just wonder whether at Ascot creative force can 
reverse this particular piece of form. He doesn't have very much to find. They flash past together there. And I do think that Creative Force, who won a jersey earlier on in the year, is very well suited by Ascot. And under these conditions, mm. he ran very well in a July Cup. Um, the stiffer test at Ascot, I think the standard time is a couple of seconds quicker of a six at Ascot than it is at Newmarket, for example. I think that will see Creative Force in a much better light. And I'm kind of at a, a bit of a toss-up stage between Dragon Symbol and Creative Force from that July Cup form as to which way I'd go. In terms of that race, I think Creative Force can reverse form with uh, Kinross. Yeah, I'm nodding away about Creative Force. I think he is a big player. Let's have a look at the Group 1 Sprint Cup, shall we? You mentioned that Emirati Anna won it. He's not running here at Ascot, but the horses that finish 10th, 6th, 5th and 4th are, notably Art Power and Happy Romance. Yeah, um, and again, it, it is a, a piece of form that Creative Force represents. Art Power mm. um, ran extremely well from the front here. He only drops away relatively late on. Emirati Anna a shame that we're not going to see him but I don't think these would have been his conditions and talking of conditions quick ground here unusually to some extent for a, a Haydock Sprint Cup probably again didn't suit Creative Force very quick ground over a sharp six I don't think he's really his bag and again I, I look at him in this race and think he has run so well under a set of circumstances that won't suit him as well as what Ascot will that I, I, I start to like him even more Final thoughts on this race then, Chris? Uh, not a, an absolute top level Group 1, but a very intriguing and, and high quality race in its own right. For me, Dragon Symbol and Creative Force, um, finding it hard to pick between them, but one of the two would have to be my selection. Do you need me to give one? Yes, of, of course I do. <laughs> what a silly uh, question. Creative Force is a bigger well price. Done is the right answer, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much for Chris for now. We'll be hearing more from him later in the show when he's back with some Dixon data. So, of course, you'll know that there is no two-year-old race on Kipco British Champions Day, although the organisers have made no secret of the fact that they would like to see one. But our show last week was all about the Future Champions Festival, and we thought that given that the key winners of those races aren't going to be racing again this season, we thought we'd reflect on what they achieved at that festival. So this is how the European two-year-old performance figures and ratings currently stand. And Native Trail still tops the tree at 1-2-2, albeit it was given a performance figure for 1-2-1 one, one after winning the Dewhurst. So like Godolphin's Pinatuba before him, albeit not as markedly, he couldn't match his national stakes rating at Newmarket. However, the runner-up, Dubawi Legend, has been raised to 1-1-6. One, one, Bayside Boys on 1-1-4. One, one, Native Trail's stable companion, Caribus, is on 1-1-4 one, one, after he won the Autumn Stakes Group 3, uh, delivering on that flash of brilliance that he showed when beaten in the Royal Lodge previously. And the filly in Spiral has, is also an upward mover up to 113 and I should mention the Cornwallis winner as well on 110 that is Twilight Jet the events of the weekend have caused Graham Smith who is the two year old handicapper for the BHA to um, upgrade his view of some of Britain's two year old pattern races this is collateral or back handicapping and it's designed to maintain the cohesion of the file so he's taken a more positive view now in light of the last weekend's events of the Mayhill the Rockfell uh, the Prestige it's a good one this year the Champagne pain and markedly so of course the Aiken. Sam your reflections let's go through them individually start with the filly in spiral who's unbeaten and her latest success was in the filly's mile. Yeah I thought it was a really good performance as well Lydia um, as most people did who saw it um, albeit her, her last furlong was the, was the slowest recorded on the day but I think that was because she paid for the exertions early on in the race I think perhaps I'm probably doing jockeys a disservice but the, the wonder of Frankie Dittori is getting a filly like her who's quite exuberant, who latches on a little bit early on, um, just to settle and, and maintain her equilibrium through those early parts of the races before then delivering that turn of foot and that race winning challenge. I think it was evident on Friday afternoon, obviously she raced with just one rival in Cachet who was good enough to take it deep into the race. Um, and it was a really good performance, I felt, because she could have been keen, she could have pulled her chance away, but thanks to Dittori's skill, and his handling, she then delivered that race winning challenge and she ticked a lot of boxes. You know, she's now been to Newmarket, she's raced in and out of the dip. She can only be better, surely, in a bigger field with a more genuine pace. And I, I think she's been quite aggressively campaigned this year and mm. she's learnt on the job with every run. So 
I thought it was a it was a stunning performance. I thought there were perhaps one or two little chinks in the armour. I thought there were other horses in the race that could have caused the trouble. But you know, going to that last hundred yards, she was well in command, and uh, there was never ever really a, a moment's worry when she quickened past the field, uh, going out of the dip. So it's the 1,000 guineas, the Keep Clear 1,000 guineas that is uh, got it rung round in the calendar for Inspiral and John Gosden saying afterwards that it depends on how she trains over the winter, whether he might take in a trial or just satisfy with himself with a racecourse gallop prior to that classic. Sam, let's talk about Native Trail, shall we, and what he did in the Dewhurst. Yeah, I, I, I thought this was another terrific performance. I think he's learning on the job even more than perhaps Inspiral or Caribius, to be honest, because... He had to do something really on, on Saturday, which he'd never done before, and that was race amongst horses, really, and then find and navigate a passage through and then quicken. And he managed to do that in spades. I think his closing sectional was, was 23.48 from the, from the two and 12.40 from the furlough marker, which was quicker than Caribbean. So it just shows you that your eyes can sometimes be deceived by a flash of brilliance from his stable mate, whereas Native Trail was actually dealing in data and, and managed to win very comfortably i thought he would have learned a lot from saturday um yeah i was a little bit worried and i think one or two people who sort of dealt with him in his formative stages as well were worried that he's he's a big powerful imposing individual with big feet and takes a while to get organized and they were a little bit concerned going down into that dip and out of it that might just see him unbalanced and you know perhaps his chance compromised but there was no evidence of that really and as I say, we'll have learned a bit racing in behind the bridle, behind one or two rivals. He just saw he's got a great sort of mind and determination and that raking stride of his as well. He really does grab at the ground. You wouldn't want to see him on lightning fast ground, perhaps around Epsom. That would Agreed. be my only slight concern. But I think the Guineas ground, you know, in the spring should be perfect. And um, he rates at, you know, one of the top two year olds we've seen this year, if not the best colt. He's a miler, isn't he, though? He's by a race. Yeah, through. I think he is. Yeah, and, and just I think the manner of his performances at the Curra in the national stakes where he took a while to get going, but then really picked up. I mean, he's a very, very strong miler, you know, and he looks he looks that, doesn't he? He looks a horse that, you know, really can engage in that eighth furlong at a pace that other horses aren't capable with. But, you know, you, you see in comparison to his stable mate as well, he's still got that turn of foot. I mean, you do the two furlong split for Mostadaf as well, 114 rated. He did 24.20. Native Trail did 23.48, you know, knocked it out of the, out the water, really. And for a two-year-old to do that, even over a shorter trip, is exceptional. So how about Caribus then? Yeah, obviously worried out of the Royal Lodge, so they rode him with marked um, different tactics on Saturday. They had paid off well. He's got that touch of brilliance as well, hasn't he? The way that he just literally took that field apart. Um, obviously, it was a Group 3 level. I don't think he was tackling anything of the quality uh, that um, Native Trail did, but it was still an exemplary performance. And you could say that he could have gone quicker. He, he's obviously quite a flashy individual who, once he gets to the front, stamps his authority on the race. He thinks he's done enough, and he was just pulling himself up a bit at the line. But that, that acceleration that both of them showed in slightly different ways, you know, Caribbean probably be more natural talent. He'd be a David Gower whereas Native Trail, perhaps more hours to cook, but we'll get 150 through the day. You know, he's that type of horse. He, he doesn't, he's not quite so flashy. He's a bit more workmanlike, but that doesn't mean to say that his raking stride, you know, won't take him clear of good quality horses. Caribbean's probably a little quicker, um, a little bit of more natural talent. And we, we saw two exemplary performances from both on Saturday. OK. Sam, thank you very much for your thoughts. We need to move on. We're going to get some Dixon data. So let's get back to Champions Day and we're going to have a look at some sectional time data and what we can learn from that data to get a lay of the land so far as the track is concerned. Lydia's already spoken about the way that races develop at uh, Ascot and the type of test the track offers. But what do the times tell us? Well, overall, the closing par times tell us that it is a good, solid overall test, but not an extreme test in either terms of speed or stamina. The races never really offer a real test of finishing speed or become a real slog where they're absolutely walking home. Some very stiff tracks, the end of a race, the finish is very slow. Some very sharp tracks, it is uh, very quick. At Ascot, it is fairly level. The par times hover, the closing sectional pars hover either side of 100% fairly closely. So as I say, it suggests that it's a good solid test, but not extreme in any sense. 
The slowest uh, section, finishing section of races tends to come over a mile and a half. That has the slowest uh, closing par, while mile races on the straight track have the fastest par. And if you want to take a comparison between the round course and the straight course, then perhaps you can do so by looking at the finishing pars for the mile races on each. The round course offers a slightly slower finishing par, suggesting that those races are maybe a tiny little bit more testing uh, late on than those on the straight track. But the straight track, still a good even test. And often, because races develop quite early on, the pace can regularly quicken from halfway or even earlier. Uh, the time show us that when you break them down furlong by furlong, then it often does, as Lydia mentioned earlier, suit horses closing from off the pace. If you want to link all of this to maybe a clue during the course of Champions Day, well, go back to that mile and a half, and that being a real slow finishing par. Well, when uh, both Mishrif and Adyar met earlier on in the King George in the year, that was over a mile and a half on the round course. That slow finish probably played to the strengths of Adyar much more than it did Mishrif. Remember how powerful Adyar was late on. Back down to 10 furlongs, a slightly greater emphasis on finishing speed than over a mile and a half. It might just play to the strengths of Mishrif more than Adyar. Chris, thank you very much for that. While you're there, I wonder whether I can just get your potted thoughts about the Balmoral. Yeah, uh, the Balmoral, wide open handicap. I think by the time we get there, Lydia, the draw um, might well have, have said one way or the other as to which, way, which side of the track you want to be on. If it has, from a selfish point of view, I'm hoping that it's saying low because that's where Ross Collins drawn. But I think uh, many punters will be hoping that it's saying high because that is where Sunray Major, who looks the best handicapped horse in the field, is drawn in the high numbers. I think he's uh, got uh, stalled 21. So he's going to be in the high numbers. I think it's chopped and changed the draw on the straight track during the course of the season at Ascot. And I'm sure that Sunray Major is a very well handicapped horse. And if it's a level playing field right across the course, he's probably better handicapped than anything else. Chris, thank you so much for your contributions to the knowledge. We're going to hear from Sam Turner to finish off the Champions Day card later on in the show. But first, we're going to take a trip down memory lane. Now we're going to look back at the 2014 Kipco British Champions Stakes, which produced a pulsating finish between Noble Mission and Al Kazim. And joining me for this bit of nostalgia is James Doyle, and he's uniquely placed to talk about this race because he rode Noble Mission throughout the previous seat that season and on the day, and also, of course, was partnered with Al Kazim for much of the preceding season and three times in 2014. George Baker, however, rode the horse in the champion stakes. But James joins me now. And James, just for everybody at home, can you remind them why you ended up riding Noble Mission rather than Al Kazim on the day? Yes, well, I started riding for Roger Charlton at the end of sort of 2012. And um, at sort of halfway through that year, um, I uh, got offered a contract to ride for uh, Prince Carl Abdullah of Jobmont. And that took me through to the following year which hence uh, tied me to uh, Noble Mission um, then after. And obviously, George, like you mentioned, rode um, Al Kazim. So let's remind everybody about Noble Mission. Of course, he was always burdened by the fact that he was Frankel's year younger full brother. Uh, remind me of uh, what you'd enjoyed with him. Yes, it was. Um, it, I mean, it's, it, things didn't start too great for um, myself and Noble Mission. We, I rode him in the, um, the pre-dollar and um, we actually got drawn one, which uh, wasn't an ideal um, scenario as, as the horse had been kind of held on to before. And we mentioned that we'd like to change tactics a little bit and try and make the running with him in France that day. But from stall one, he completely missed the break and um, we ended up at the, the back and could never land a blow. And then obviously he, he finished for the season. And we came back um, at Newbury and it was a similar scenario again. He um, just did, didn't begin all that well and we ended up at the back and he ran a really good race to finish second um, that day. And we, we thought we really need to do something to change it up a little bit. So we um, did some stalls work with him to try and get him out the stalls a bit better. And um, we had a wide stall in the Gordon Richards and we were able to, he, he jumped nicely that day and we were able to make all and 
he never looked back once once we got those little things um little adjustments um right and he just never looked back since um after after that Yes, he hadn't looked a Group 1 horse, but that season going into the race, he, he was. He'd won the Tattersall's Gold Cup and he was just done on the line um, in the Grand Prix de saint Cloud, although he was awarded the race subsequently. Yes, um, I mean, it certainly was the making of him uh, when, when he could uh, dictate his races from the front end. And uh, it, it was obviously key to him getting plenty of juice in the ground. Uh, mm. We felt in uh, San Clou that day, we felt he was just getting a little bit cute um, being in front for s sort of so long throughout his races. Um, he used to wear a hood uh, with the, the proper silicone inserts in them. So uh, it was quite uh, an interesting conversation between myself, George Scott, who was assistant trainer to Lady Jane Cecil at the time. And we felt going to, um, going to Champions Day, we needed to, sort of switch things up maybe not take the uh the hood off altogether but um it was george scott's idea to take out the silicone um that that completely dulls all, all the sort of uh, outside noise um uh, but keep the hood on but just have the material um around his ears so he felt like he was still wearing it and it certainly it certainly worked the trick on on the day Okay, let's switch to Al Kazim, who you'd had such a fine partnership with the previous season, winning three Group Ones in the space of six weeks. Yes, he was a, he was an amazing horse. He um, I picked up the ride on him in in the uh, jockey club at Newmarket, and he he was a pretty exceptional winner that day. And we were sort of really excited by um, what he could do for that season. Unfortunately, he he sustained I think it was a fractured pelvis, so that put him out um, for the season. But in, in, in a similar kind of um, similar path to Noble Mission, he, he ran and sort of started off in similar races, but he was a little bit more versatile in regards to ground. Hence, he ran at, um, at Royal Ascot and won the Prince of Wales there and won the Eclipse. Whereas Noble Mission, we just felt uh, we, we should kind of, to keep him to being a Group 1 horse, we just felt um, softer conditions would certainly suit him. So he was campaigned a little bit differently. And at the end of 2013, he was all set to go off and be a stallion. That didn't quite go to plan. So hence his owner, breeder John Deere, brought him back to the track. And actually he did really well in terms of a horse that had started off being a stallion, then coming back and what he was able to achieve. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's um, remarkable. And I mean, full credit to Roger Charlton and his team, because it can't be an easy thing to do when you let, you know, he, we have to remember he was a big, gorgeous looking horse. Um, with pl plenty of scope and to let him down, you know, I, I guess stallions change completely different when they're, they're not doing their, their sort of day-to-day -day fitness raging. Uh, but he had a great, a great mindset on him. He was, he was a perfect horse for me to ride in, in, in group ones when I hadn't experienced um, and, and riding in group ones, he was just a perfect horse to ride in, in regards to, he was so versatile tactically and he he really looked after me right the way through but like you say to come back and still have the retain the level of ability and and the mindset to perform at group one level was is you know a true testament to not only the horse but uh, mr charlton and his team he was a little bit burly coming back understandably after his stallion duties then he won the group three winter hill under george you were on his back for when he was fifth in the irish champion behind the great gatsby and tenth behind trev in the arc so where do you think he was going into the champion stakes in 2014. yeah i mean it it, it was kind of i mean i i had so much respect for the horse having having ridden him sort of all, all the way through through his career that I, I kind of knew what he was capable of and and I think um I George used to ride him work quite a bit as obviously I'd, I'd moved up to kind of new market at, at that stage and George used to say you know he, he said I will give you a race in in the um champion states he feels <laughs> right back to his best he's got a real spring in his step and um I, I knew he he, he well he, I, I knew he'd definitely be um up, up to running a very strong race and um it was difficult to to sort of weigh up how the race would go on the day because the the ground was absolutely atrocious and it was so bad that at one point when I was walking the track I almost thought about coming under the trees but looking back thank thank God I didn't. <laughs>
It wasn't just those two, though. Uh, we also had uh, the race for which um, there was a standing dish. Sirius de Zegler, who'd won the race in 2011, second to Frankel in 2012, second to Farr in 2013. He was made favourite for his ex outstanding record. As you mentioned, the conditions would suit him. Free Eagle, the lightly raced three-year-old for Dermot Weld and Pat Smullen was also there, the 5-2 to two second favourite. And Rule of the World, last year's Derby winner for Aidan O'Brien, who'd since been beaten in the Irish Derby and twice in France, including last time out in the arc by Trev. So what were your thoughts tactics-wise? You said you mentioned the track. Um, you ended up going forward with, with, no, with Noble Mission. What were your thoughts immediately beforehand? Well, it, it, was always the, it was always the plan to, as we sort of mentioned earlier, it was always the plan to, he, he was a horse who liked it. He, he, he was actually quite a strong horse and I, I didn't ride, I think I sat on him once when uh, the guy who used to ride him out at home uh, was unfortunately not well. So George Scott rang to ask me, could I gallop him? And I think that was the only time I sat on him at home. He completely took off with me and the, the gallop was a disaster. So he, he was quite... Um, he he got better but he was quite difficult to ride in the sense that you, you had to let him once we got him jumping out the stalls a bit better uh, it was just a case of le largely leaving it a, a lot down down to noble mission himself and just trying not to interfere with him too much mm. and i think it, it it largely depended on what the horses around him did as well it, i think um we were quite fortunate that day from our draw he bounced into a nice lead i just had to ask him a little bit to get striding as the ground was so deep. And then thankfully, uh, we got largely an uncontested lead. Al Kazim sat second to me and he was a horse who did like to, to take a lead. He wasn't a natural kind of front runner. So I was pretty comfortable after going um, a couple of furlongs, but that was always the plan to try and dictate. And on, on that ground, we, we all had a good chat beforehand. We thought it was quite key to be a little bit more patient with him and not asking for, for usually from sort of three and a half furlongs out we used to really put them to the sword and he, he'd kind of win his race there but we just felt on such deep conditions and at Ascot as we know it's a testing track we just felt we could be afford to be a little bit more patient and perhaps not go for home as, as soon as we we had done in the past. And then there was an absolutely riveting battle between Noble Mission and Al Kazim. Talk me through your recollections of that. Well, I, I, obviously knowing Al Kazim, I knew he, he was a real fighter. He, he, he used to love a, a, a tussle and um, he, he joined me sort of, I guess, just before the two furlong pole recollecting. And, you know, I wasn't surprised at all to see that it was Al Kazim. I, I recognised him straight away and I thought <laughs> this is going to be hard work. But um, full credit to um, both horses. You know, I, I didn't feel that either one of them shirked it. It was a, just a real good tussle down, down the straight and, Thankfully, we just had enough in reserves and we were given just enough rope to kind of save plenty for the last half of Furlong and Noble Mission actually drew away and, um, you know, it was it was head and head down to sort of half Furlong out and then gradually we just started to get the upper hand um, in, the, in the last half of Furlong. And I guess probably the the tough conditions probably took its took its toll on, on Alka team. He, he was a beautiful mover who, who would have preferred better ground, I would think. And it, obviously it was an incredibly emotional result in that Noble Mission was trained by Lady Jane Cecil, the wife of the late Henry Cecil, who died just before Royal Ascot in 2013. He'd trained Frankel, who was the horse that really made British Champions Day. And this really the justification in many ways, I think, or, or the reward for Lady Jane Cecil taking over the reins at such a difficult time in her life. Absolutely. I, I remember thinking beforehand how how amazing it could be uh, to you know no illusions how, how tough it would be um, to, to win the champion stakes uh, and and we had big boots to fill after Frankel obviously winning it two years before and no mission being his full brother but it, we, we felt that it was definitely possible and it, it was it was really quite kind of nerve-wracking I mean I, I I do remember when Lady Jane and George uh, Scott came to collect the saddle they, they looked so nervous and I, actually to be fair I, I was fairly relaxed about the situation in, in that we knew how the, how we were going to ride him and we kind of I, I was pretty confident and excited and I just had to try and get the guys to relax they were they looked so nervous and I didn't want that sort of coming through to me so I said look guys what will be will be but 
we, we've we've got everything under control. So let, let's just hope it goes as well as as well as it can. And to produce a finish like that, and I remember coming back into the the winners' enclosure, how emotional everybody was, and it, it was full, full credit to Lady Jane because it and George. It was a lot of a lot of pressure taking over and and you know trying to just you know I wouldn't say big boots to fill because obviously they were but no one was trying to fill Sir Henry's boots at all it was just trying to maintain and keep keep the level um of, of the st- st- stable up and um I, I was I'd never forget being so proud of of what everyone the whole team had achieved and it was a amazing day that was met with a really um sort of humbling um atmosphere on, on the return to the winners enclosure yes it was incredible that atmosphere um led Jane saying that it would have been a fairy tale beforehand if the horse won and then he did actually manage to win in your hands there were some footnotes to the day of course um James receives a, a seven day ban for using his what his whip over the permitted level and a ten thousand pound fine I mean these are things that are still issues that still aren't resolved today and we've got the whip consultation even in 2021 trying to address these circumstances and other footnotes as well no permission was retired after this success and now stands at Lane's End farm Kentucky uh, whereas Al Kazim shortly afterwards it, would anna- it was announced that he would stay in training as a seven-year-old and that decision was fully justified because he had a fruitful 2015 winning the group one Tassels Gold Cup winning that race for the second time and he now stands for um, as the plan B for owner breeder John Deere as his, at his own Oak Grove stud near Chepstow. So James, your final thoughts. And what, it, it, as you look as you look back, wh- where do you where do you rank this race in in the achievements of your life? You, I mean, because you've had so many. Yeah, no. Well, I think obviously um, Cityscape over in Dubai at the time was was uh, you know totally unexpected. I mean, we were expected him to go well, but the experience just completely caught caught me off guard. And then we had Al Kazim, who who um, was so fantastic um at my first sort of proper cracks in group ones and then obviously the same year as noble mission we had we had kingman as well so i, I was very lucky to to ride such uh, amazing horses in in those couple of years but i think the whole experience of champions day um with noble mission it, it it's it was like i say a truly humbling experience and one that i won't forget and it could have been um you know it, i know how difficult horse racing is and to win those big races, it's, it's so tough, but to, to get all those little things right. And I think it was a real story um, in the sense that things didn't go so well in my first couple of starts riding the horse that we really had to work at it and, and form a partnership. And for, for everyone to, to watch, I think um, it, it was quite a pleasing experience for everyone involved, really. And um, it's, it's always a race back that um, I, well, I love talking about the race and, and also watching it back. It was, a, it was an incredible race to ride in. James, thank you so much for your recollections. Your thoughts, I think, will enrich the experience of watching the whole race back, which is what we're going to do right now. That's it. They're all in. And they're off and racing for the Gitco Champion Stakes. And early on, Noble Mission is encouraged into the lead. Keep on Cyrus de Zegler from wider out. Christoph Sumion is pressing forward, just trying to get behind Al Kazim early on. Pethers Moon and Ruler of the World just trying to hold Cyrus de Zegler deep. Sheikh Zayed Road is off the back end. So as they prepare already to swing at the far end of the race course, Noble Mission leads by a length from Al Kazim. Cyrus de Zegler has a little bit of cover on the outside with Ruler of the World in third place, just ahead of Cyrus de Zegler. Then Pethers Moon on the rails is free easy early on ahead of Western Him, then Arad and Sheikh Zayed Road is at the rear of the field. So they're already swinging uh, right-handed. Three furlongs behind them, Noble Mission stretching on out in front from Ruler of the World to dispute second place with Al Kazim. Cirrus de Zegler still held three wide with Three Eagle up the rails and between the pair Pethers Moon. Arad comes next alongside Western Him as they pass the six with Sheikh Zayed Road at the tail of the field. So it's Noble Mission leading by just over a length or so from Ruler of the world and then in third place on the outside Al Kazim. Cyrus de Zegler making a little bit of ground but is still wide on the track from Pethers Moon then Free Eagle. Behind these Western Him then Arad and Sheikh Zayed Road. Noble Mission still racing exuberantly 
on the front end as they enter the final half mile. Al Kazim and ruler of the world poised. Cirrus de Zegler circles them. Free Eagle on the rails with Petter's Moon. Western Him tries to improve. Noble Mission bidding to emulate Frankel. Passes the three out in front. Ruler of the world is pushed along. Al Kazim travelling really strongly. Cirrus de Zegler under quite a bit of pressure. Petter's Moon's path was blocked. Then Free Eagle. It is out in front. Noble Mission with Al Kazim hunting down the leader. Cirrus de Zegler's paddling back in the field. Free Eagle trying to get organised and launch a challenge at the front pair. Noble Mission on the far side. Al Kazim on the near side. Free Eagle is trying to bridge the gap. Has three lengths to five. Noble Mission digging in. Al Kazim drawing alongside. Head for head. The champion stakes in the balance. Noble Mission clinging on narrowly. Noble Mission from Al Kazim all out. Noble Mission. Noble Mission has won the champion stakes. A punch in the air. Lady Cecil and James Doyle, Frankel's full brother, follows in his hoofprints. So here is the significance of the Kipco British Champions Phillies and Mares Stakes. It's a Group 1 over a mile and a half for three-year-olds and upwards. And there's its history, established in 1946. And let's just say things got complicated after that. Uh, has been known as the Pride Stakes, has been staged at Newmarket, but reverted to Ascot and its original title in 2011 with the creation of Champions Day. And down the bottom, that's where you might go next, including America or Hong Kong at the end of the season and Dubai next. Luminaries of the flat have dominated this race in the past, but no horse has won it twice since it has been re brought back to Ascot in 2011 and Dancing Rain is the fastest winner of this race in that year since it has been staged back at Ascot. Now there's going to be some arm wrestling about the middle distance standings in Europe because Tanawa's got a rating of 122 and Snowfall, who's the only one on that graphic who's actually taking part in Saturday's race at Ascot, is on 120. But her performance figure with the BHA at the ARC is £2 lower and Tanawa's £3 lower. Um, they, the BHA also disagree with the French handicapper on the opera first and second, Rougier and Grand Glory. And I should mention that Lady Bo thought that is a performance figure for her Nassau stake success over 10 furlongs, so hence the middle distance, what, her, what she's achieved over middle distances, she's actually rated 117 for her lockage performance over a mile. So these are the declarations, just the eight runners. And we are going to start by looking at probably what is the key form line. It's the Yorkshire Oaks. It was won Impressively by Snowfall, with Alba Flora behind, Laja Cond in third, and Ashada disappointing in last, Sam. Yes, Lydia, the um, third of her Oaks trilogy, wasn't it, here for Snowfall, and um, extremely well backed on, on this occasion, and understandably so on the back of her um, heroics in, in Ireland and also at Epsom. Um, ran away with this and routed a decent field. Alba Flora stuck on to pick up some pieces, and Ashada, as you say, uh, was very easily back and just showed absolutely nothing and dropped well out the back of the television. Unfortunately, this wasn't the Ashada that we'd seen previously um, in the Ribblesdale and in that Misty contest at Newbury where she looked promising. But this was all about snowfall. It's a one horse race from a long way out and you never had a moment's worry if you took the odds. And I don't think she particularly had to improve off the back of the two previous Oaks performances to, to do that to a field at York, which was lacking in a bit of depth and quality, especially when one or two of them underperformed. But, you know, she could do no more than win. She subsequently been to the Vermai and then obviously last time out in the arc where she ran again creditably, got stuck in a bit of traffic, but performed with great credit. And I suppose this race, you have to try and analyse whether you're a pundit, a tipster or, or a punter, what that race and that trip to Longchamp would have taken out of her in, in respect of Saturday's race. Because on the face of it, this is a far easier task than she's faced. Yeah, but we're also talking how many runs into the season is she? Seven, eight? And, you know, it's been a long old campaign. She's danced quite a few dances and she's been to some some tough races. I mean, bottomless ground at Epsom. Um, she continued to thrive off the back of that through the midsummer. And um, and she's been kept going. We're deep into the autumn here. She's had a grueling trip and a, and a, a tough one at, at Longchamp as well. Is that going to just take the edge of her ahead of Saturday's performance? So... These are all things and equations that um, punters, tipsters and analysts alike have to try and 
evaluate. Whereas Alba Flora is fresher, is that the only angle to see a reversal of that form? It needed quite a marked reversal of that form. Yeah, and I suppose the Ascot form as well. Alba Flora has, has been there, done it, and, and she's run pretty creditably at Ascot before. Um, yeah, as I say, she was probably ridden to pick up some pieces. She wasn't involved in the heat of the battle at York, and she comes here off the back of, of that performance and a nice break. So, yeah, she's had a, probably a slightly better preparation, whereas the, the snowfall preparation, this feels a little bit like an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Ada Bryan might well tell us something different, but, you know, she just looks as though she's the type of horse, really, that, um, you know, is spinning on here because she's come out of Longchamp well and, and eaten up and, and, and has reportedly thrived. But you don't know until you get into the heat of battle quite how these fillies are going to react to another run. Um, in the deep autumn with a bit of soft ground around Ascot. Now you mentioned this Sharda and her having better form. We're having a look now at her Newbury success at the start of the season in listed company over 10 furlongs. She went on, of course, to finish second in the Ribblesdale. Sam, is she better judged on, on the Ribblesdale and this? I, I think so. I mean, she's obviously been vanquished by two, you know, Goldstone fillies, um, you know, but she looked promising early season. Now, what happened at York, I don't know, is she bowled over a little bit. Um, obviously, there can, there can be issues with some fillies sometimes at York, but, you know, the time in the pre-parade and the parade and then down to post, that can cause one or two issues. And, and you know, I'm not sure if anything came to light that I'm, I'm not privy to. But, you know, she was very easy to back that day as well, which was disconcerting, really, off the back of a really good run at Royal Ascot um, when she finished off quite well and, and pulled clear of, of the third and fourth that day and chasing, trying to chase down the Goldstone winner. So um, the fact that they are pursuing this season with her, the fact that the Phillies have continued to be in pretty good form, the Marion team, obviously Tiona landing the Priva Mai, and, you know, the fact that, you know, Sharda hasn't been shuffled off, you know, to, um, to become a broodmare somewhere, I think that suggests that they're expecting quite a big run. The better ground will perhaps suit her a little bit as well. So, you know, fingers crossed she, she can regain something of that reputation that she started to accumulate in the early season. Now, Sam, I know there's another filly you want to talk about, and I can really understand this. That filly's invite, isn't it? Yes, I was very, very taken with it, Chester. Obviously, we haven't got the VT, but um, interesting, really, that Team Bala had a couple of runners in this race. Le Petit Coco doesn't go. Of course, the race has been decimated, really, with the fact that free win doesn't run and, and neither does love. So I think in the anti-post book, the three main protagonists have all come out and that's really opened the race up, obviously for Snowfall, but I think also for Invite, who showed a really electric turn of foot, I thought, at the Rudy to, to go and quick and pass the Lunac and, and win quite a competitive contest. Um, I like the fact she's fresh and well. The balding team have done well with her since inheriting her from uh, Marco Botti. Uh, and it just looked that Team Valor were, were targeting this race with a couple of runners and they're happy to let her take a chance. I think she represents, you know, very each way, a very interesting each way angle into this race with the ground seemingly no issue and the fact that she's had a nice light campaign and comes here fresh. OK, interesting stuff. So that's the Phillies and Mares over a mile and a half. We're going to stick with the middle distance category, but we're dropping to 10 furlongs for the champion stakes. The crescendo of Kitco British Champions Day is its eponymous race, the Champion Stakes, and over the years it's produced some memorable winners and memorable battles, as you've seen earlier in the show. And its history is a little bit more straightforward. It's a Group 1. It's always been a Group 1 since the inauguration of the pattern, although it was established in 1877. It used to be staged at Newmarket, but was transferred permanently to Ascot when British Champions Day was created. And winners and horses that run well in this can go on to America or Hong Kong or Dubai and all the top middle distance races of next year. Hopefully they're not just shuffled off to stud. There are the people who've been most successful in this race. Sirius de Zegel is the fastest winner since it's been staged at Ascot. The Fugue, though, has the track record on a quicker surface. Now, here are the middle distance standings in Europe. Adiar, Mishrif and St Mark's Basilica, the last of which, of course, is retired. They are the highest rated horses in the world on 127. 
Adeyeb earned 125 when winning last year's champion stakes. So far, he's got a performance figure of 120 for his Eclipse second and his Queen Elizabeth stakes win in Australia. Now, there are relatively large discrepancies across Europe right now in this division, as I mentioned. I talked about the gap for Tanawa and snowfall between the various European handicappers. It stems from a £4 differential in the various ARC interpretations. Torquata Tasso has a domestic German rating of 126, but a British performance figure, for example, of 122 and Hurricane Lane is three pound higher in German calculations and two pound higher in French calculations. Poetic Flair was rated 123 by the Irish handicap for his, handicapper but for his Irish champion stakes third whereas the British handicappers have him on 122 both for that and his impressive St James's Palace stakes win so there's going to be lots of fruitful and interesting arguments in order to shake down final numbers for all of these horses and of course this race will help. So 10 runners for the Kipco Champion Stakes. Superbly, we have Adiar up against Mishrif and an able supporting cast, including last year's winner, Adeyeb. Let's start, Sam, with the international stakes, where Mishrif was a hugely impressive winner by six lengths, beating Alan Kerr with Max Sweeney back in fifth. Yeah, exhilarating performance, Lydia, wasn't it? Um, everything that we felt that Mishrif could deliver. He delivered here on the Naismar. Travelled beautifully in the hands of Dave Egan. Uh, raced pretty handily off what looked a, a really decent pace as well. And then just quick and majestically clear of you know his toiling rivals on that occasion. You can poke one or two, one or two little issues at the form if you like, and, and perhaps one or two horses weren't best suited by the conditions uh, as Mishrif was but this was just a majestic performance how he's lengthened in the top class performance you know putting good distance between himself and his rivals with an exhilarating turn of foot and you know this is the Mishrif we, we know and love and the one that you know we expect to see hopefully on Saturday albeit he was eighth in the race last year when a well fancied horse behind a day of that day. OK, we'll come back to Mishrif and what his ground requirements might be. But next, we're going to have a look at the Derby and take a look at Max Sweeney again. He finished fourth in that. Bolshoi Bali, of whom much was expected, he finished seventh. Of course, he's gone on to win a grade one in America since. He has, yeah. Um, you know, that race is starting to stack up quite nicely now. And obviously, there slips through on the rail, as we all know, under Adam Kirby and, and shows a really good turn of foot. A turn of foot that suggests that Dropping back to this extended mile and a quarter uh, shouldn't be a, a, a concern for him, really. Um, obviously, he competed over that sort of trip early on in his career and then has really progressed and thrived as he stepped up to a mile and a half, uh, even with a bit of cut in the ground. So, you know, we um, we see Max Sweeney as possibly one of the front runners here, you know, with the likes of perhaps a Dave who might run, might race quite prominently. Um, and maybe one or two others that might like to sit handy to the to the pace as well. A day are as he drops back in trip, Mishrif won't be too far away. So it looks a race that should be run at a genuine gallop and, and Max Sweeney will hopefully contribute to that. What was your reading of Adiar in the R? Clearly he had the interrupted preparation. He wasn't able to take a stepping stone to the race as intended by Charlie Appleby. Is it possible that he'll actually do a lot better for that run? Yeah, quite conceivably. I mean, it was his first run since, you know, the end of July, um, and that King George performance. So, you know, he was entitled to improve and, and thrive for it. It's it's only been a couple of weeks. It was a bit of a slog in the mud at Longchamp, as everybody knows. But, you know, you would, you would think that he'd be capable of stepping forward. I've just got that, you know, very much in my in my mind's eye, that, that King George performance and Mishriff, you know, raging up to him. And now they are just saying, no, thanks, chap, I'm off, and, and just powering clear. And, you know, for me, he's, he's you know, the, the quality colt of the year. He's got a turn of foot. He travels well. He operates on any ground. And he seems pretty versatile over any trip. I think if they go a decent gallop for him, which enables him to slot in from nine, which is a little bit wider than ideal. And as we saw in the King George, he was pretty keen where Broom did him a favour that day. Um, if he can just get slotted in from nine and, and get some cover early, he should be in a good position turning for home and, he has got that turn of foot and that acceleration, the change of gear that we've seen so often this year, put that to good use. Does 10 furlongs bring them closer together than the King George? I think that is the key form line, Adiar and Mishrif clashing. Yeah, obviously the, the speed figure from that day was, was absolutely scintillating. So it was a, a very truly run race, um, courtesy of one or two of the others in the race, Broom, etc. Um, and it probably does, but... 
I think yes, you, you see Mishriff over more of his in, in his comfort zone over ten, and Adiar is having to then go into his backyard really into Mishriff's backyard and, and tackle him over his optimum trip. Whereas Adiar is probably at his best over over twelve, but. Just the way that Adiar races, the fact he's quite exuberant, he's quite keen, you would think that just going that step quicker over 10 should suit him ideally, just get him to drop his head a little bit more, make him a little bit more tractable. Not that he's out of control by any stretch, but he was certainly keen enough in the King George. Um, hopefully that arc performance might just take the fizz out of him a little bit and we can see a, a great duel again between the two of them. OK, let's examine the form line and another key form line, which is the Eclipse. Um, won, of course, by St Mark's Basilica, but Adeyev was second and Mishrif was third, returning from something of a break, Sam. Yeah, and there were obviously noises that he wasn't straight and 100% going into this race. And he, he, he certainly ran like that a little bit. He travelled up very strongly up to the quarters of Adeyev, sort of headed him a little bit and then just faded late on as St Mark's Basilica and his change of gear kicked in. Um, and he couldn't live with it. But it was, a, it was a good performance from a number of them in, in different ways, really. I mean, had they been ridden eight times by Tom Marquand, won five and been second on three other occasions. He stuck to his task gamely here, albeit he couldn't match the brilliance of St. Mark's Basilica, who really is the only high-quality cult that's missing from Saturday's field, really. Mm. Um, and we see a day just, just battling on just to, just to take a, a toiling uh, mishriff and, and grab him for second. But... You know, Adeb's a really interesting campaigner. He, although he's seven, um, he's obviously been targeted this race again, you know, completely all season. Um, you know, probably a lot of his rivals are the same way as well. They, they will have had this race as their target for much of the season, but him most notably because we haven't seen him for 105 days. As I say, he's got such a brilliant record with Mark Andon. You know, two of his, his three best um, performances in his career have both come over the course of distance. He goes well with cutting the ground, he's got a great record fresh. I think May 2019 was the last time he was out of the first three. I mean, he really has been an astonishing horse and brilliantly campaigned. So, you know, if you uh, if you want an each way bet against the front two in the market, then probably a Dave is, is the place that you'd be looking. Yes, so he's particularly well suited by Ascot as well. Uh, William Haggis, of course, trains him. He also trains Dubai Honour, who's a really interesting horse. We can have a look at his clash with Fox's Tails. That was when he was uh, receiving quite a bit of weight from the runner at Fox's Tails. But since then, he's gone on to carry on before all before him at a much higher grade. Yeah, I managed to get him beat off 91 in the Britannia, um, albeit he was drawn on the wrong side of the track and ran really creditably. Um, he then followed up, obviously, the July meeting in, with this performance and, and quickened up really well. I think, I think his trainer attributes the trip to Laura Collett as the reason why this horse has turned himself inside out this year. I think he was almost untrainable um, in the autumn of last year into the into the winter, early part of the winter. Anyway, he was sent to Laura Collett six weeks down the line. He came back an absolutely different model. She certainly made a man of him. and. He's just continued to thrive and progress ever since. Obviously, they paid 75000 to supplement him after that third, the Longchamp performance, sorry. And that was a really, really stunning performance. He, he quickened up so well down the outside of everything mm. in the pre-dollar. Um, uh, you know, well worth the seventy-five to supplement. You know, if he's still thriving and going forward, then he could be a really interesting contender here because that turn of foot that he displayed in Longchamp if that's well employed here on the home turn, you know, he could be a difficult horse to resist. But this is an absolute different level. You know, Mishriff and Adi are already proven as top quality Colts and, you know, group one performers, genuine group one performance multiple times. So it's a big ask for him, really. It's a big ask for him to even beat a day, but it's worth a punt. Yes, I don't think he should be underestimated at all. So your <laughs> final thoughts, Sam, on how you think this is going to pan out? Um, pretty genuine pace, I think. Um, you know, the likes of Max Swinney will, will be prominent. Adar should be sitting on the, the tail of him. Just hope that he gets some cover. He's not too jazzed up from stall nine. I think if he's there turning for home, I think his stamina could kick in and he could shrug off Mishriff again. Adi to run the credible third. Sam, thank you very much for your thoughts about the Champions Stakes and the rest of Champions Day. Thank you very much for watching the knowledge at home. I hope we have guided you through the day so that your appetite is whetted. You can watch it all live here on Racing TV. And next time the knowledge is back, we'll be looking ahead to the Breeders' Cup. Bye for now.